here it is December 29th, 2018, and I'm on my way to the Air Mobility Command Museum in Dover, Delaware. I'm driving up from Virginia, and I just happen to be passing Washington, D.C. Crossing the river here at the moment. Be in the second lane from the right. Just thought I would try to catch a few of the scenes of the Capitol while I'm going through here. Can't pay much attention. Keep left to I-295 South. Can't really pay any attention to where the camera is aiming because the traffic is too busy, so I'm just generally panning it around and not looking where it's aiming. Hopefully it'll catch something worthwhile. We've been crossing the Potomac River here in its two courses. Somewhere right up here, I gotta make a left turn, it looks like. So I'm right up by Chesapeake Bay here, and we're about ready to cross the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. I think that's the correct name for it. Quite a large bridge, and I do love a good bridge crossing. Unfortunately, I'm looking into the sun, so it's not gonna be optimal.
a barge down there under the bridge and it has a uh, looks like an expanding ladder or stairway going up from it to the bridge I've never seen that before this bridge. I think if you're a Maryland resident, then it's only $2.50, but uh, I have Virginia plates on my rental car, and it was $4. to Dover and this is uh, Highway 50 I think it's still Highway 50 maybe it's uh, 301 it may have changed at some point without me noticing it I was on Highway 50 heading east but the last sign I saw said 301 so So I finally arrived at Dover Air Force Base off on the left and uh, we're just trying to get to the southwest corner of the base where the Air Mobility Command Museum is located. get a glimpse of the museum off to the left there. Take the exit on the right toward State Route 9, then take the first left. Bayside Drive. I've noticed an odd thing driving here for the last four hours through Virginia and the District of Columbia and Maryland and then Delaware that probably about a mile, turn left on Heritage Road. About nine out of ten people I saw it turning left, turning right, merging left, merging right in front of me. Only about one out of ten drivers use turn signals, which is the lowest I've ever seen anywhere in my travels. Turn left on Heritage Road. I almost wondered if there was like a local East Coast law in the Potomac region that said you didn't have to use your turn signals. It was so rarely used, it really astounded me. So here we are, approaching Heritage Road. It has its own road to go into the museum. Air Turn Mobility left Command left Museum, Road. Dover Air Force Base. This separate entrance is necessary so that civilians can enter this part of the base without getting on the rest of the base which would be impossible after 9-11 since they just they're really unlikely to let civilians into active military bases anymore even with good reason um, so in this instance they have it fenced off from the rest of the base 
and it has its own drive off of a commercial uh, highway. I have been to this museum once before, a number of years ago, but I only had about an hour here. And it's not a huge museum, but I definitely wanted to visit again, spend a little bit more time, and do a walkthrough video while I'm here. So that's my goal. Plus, I know they've added airplanes since I was here last. They may be the only museum that currently has a C5 on display. And there's one there. And it's painted in its original livery. So, um, that'll be nice. Arriving at 1301 Heritage Road on the left. I didn't find the information on the website, but uh, my understanding is that just as with many other Air Force related museums in the U.S., that this is in one way or another considered to be a, a branch location of the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, uh, or perhaps it's independent but all the planes belong to the museum. I'm not really sure how that works. Um, if I find contrary information I'll relate that. interesting about this hangar. Because the sound I originally recorded was blotted out by the wind, uh, Hangar 1301 is the home of the Air Mobility Command Museum. From 1944 to 1946 it housed the headquarters and engineering facility uh, for a unit that developed the first successful combat proven air launched rocket system used by the United States Armed Forces. So we've just gone from the, the building where the research was done on the missiles to the main hangar. And in here we have one of the Waco gliders and a B-17 and a C-47. My understanding is in about half an hour they're going to open some of the planes up outside, including the C-141 and the C-5 and some other ones, so I want to make sure I take advantage of that. I've uh, always had a fondness for the Waco Glider. It says, uh, common myths and misconceptions about military gliders. One is that gliders always crash landed, so they were only used once. In fact, they were meant to be re reused, and they were. And, uh, they were all scrapped right after World War II. It says most of them were, but uh, they kept using them afterwards. And if a glider landed in a field where it couldn't be towed out, then they would take it apart and truck it out. Or no, they said that's a misconception. Let's see, they were picked up by having a tow plane fly low overhead and hook onto a specially absorbed tow, uh, designed tow rope. Okay, anyway. Enough of that. Let's look at the airplane. Welded tubing frame, fabric skin, could fit a Jeep inside, or some troops. There's an observer plane up there. They don't have a printed guide at this museum to tell you what's what. There's a steerman there? I'm not sure. Yeah, so that is a Waco CG4A Hadrian or Hadrian. This little guy is a L2M Grasshopper by Taylor Craft. 
an observation and liaison aircraft. I, that's, that's this one up here, not this little guy on the floor looking at the wrong airplane. This thing looks more like a toy, just for kids to climb into maybe, I don't know. It doesn't look like, no, it's a fake engine, yeah. They do have little airplanes that people have built as kits that are about that size, but this is not one of them. So that's the grasshopper up there. Let's see, this is Sleepy Time Gal. The Turf and Sport Special, the C-47. This is supposed to be a uh, depiction of a double engine change at Saltby, England in 1944. And this C-47A Skytrain, Turf and Sport Special, adapted from the DC-3 commercial airliner and they were used as tow gliders and transported troops, paratroops, cargo, and supplies, of course. This was to, this plane was used to drop paratroopers on D-Day. Of course, one of my other videos has me flying in the That's All Brother, uh, which was the lead uh, plane on D-Day, or the, the lead of the C-47s. So you might want to check out that video. And this was also used in Operation Market Garden and Varsity, and also for Operation Vittles during the Berlin Airlift. So it's a notable example of the C-47. And I'm sure that this train has nothing to do with anything. Probably set it up for the Christmas exhibit. Sleepy Time Gal was a B-17 assigned to the 381st Bomb Group stationed in England. It was flown back to England or flown back to the U.S. and sold for scrap after doing 47 missions. This particular example was built by Douglas Aircraft. Looks like this one is open just to look inside. And I've flown on a number of B-17s, but I'm still going to look inside. Nicely set up. I didn't bring my big camera with me on this trip, so I'm kind of stuck as far as my available optics go with my little point and shoot. This is a uh, cockpit mock-up for a C-17 Globemaster III, which is of course one of the Air Force's main heavy transport aircraft these days.
and it's a special bulldozer the Clark Airborne Tractor model CA1 just a small bulldozer but designed to be carried around in planes such as the C-47 I'm not going to lose any sleep about not going in here because just a few months ago I was in That's All Brother which is set up really the same way says this is the Air Force's newest cargo loader capable of hauling up to six standard aircraft pallets with a total weight of 60,000 pounds can be used with the C5, C141 which of course they don't use anymore the C17 can raise up to 18 feet to load commercial cargo aircraft supposed to be representative of the inlet of a C5 engine and this is a mock-up of a C5 flight deck I presume this is the older model they've had a lot of modernization C-141 flight deck, but the lights are turned down real dim, so it's hard to see in here. It's 
think we're going to have to go outside here pretty soon. I should have mentioned earlier that the Air Mobility Command Museum, even though it has Air Force aircraft in it, unlike the other aviation museums related to the Air Force, this is restricted almost exclusively to transport aircraft or refueling aircraft with just a few exceptions. That I think makes it a bit unique out of other aviation museums I visited and highlighted. So this is a VC-9C, it's a military, a military variant of the Douglas D, um, DC-9. This transported America's top leadership from 1975 until 2011. Much of that time it served as Air Force Two for Vice Presidents Walter Mondale, George H.W. Bush, Dan Quayle, Al Gore, and Dick Cheney. It also served several of America's first ladies, Rosalind Carter, Nancy Reagan, Barbara Bush, Hillary Clinton, and Laura Bush. This aircraft was also used to transport Presidents Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush into smaller airports where the 747 couldn't be used, in which case it was also um, considered to be a call signed Air Force One at that time. And uh, it also transported visiting world leaders such as Queen Elizabeth II and the Chief of Staff of the People's Republic of China. So this has a pretty good pedigree. California, I point out the C-141 they have there, which is painted in the Hall of Drab scheme, and is a little bit worse for wear. This guy here is a C-141A, say that again, C-141A, Starlifter, made by Lockheed. This was the first jet engine military transport used by the United States Air Force. It was introduced to replace the slower propeller-driven C-124 and C-133. It had long-range, high-speed, and large load-carrying uh, load capabilities. This is the first C-141 ever built. Its maiden flight was on the 17th of, 17th of December, 1963. 
60 years to the day since the Wright brothers' first flight, and is one of only four that was not converted into a B model. So, a very significant example of the C-141, and it's a good one to have at this museum. released by Hanoi. Others know that C-141s dropped U.S. paratroopers on Panama in 1989, but the C-141 Starlifter's main job was to carry cargo, not people. This is a, <clears throat> a stretched model, the B model as I mentioned before. This one is open to walk through at this time, I believe. So let's. Here's the uh, the main runway area of Dover Air Force Base laid out in front of us. Not much to see at the moment, but we may get lucky and see some C-5s operating here since this is the main Air Force Base on the East Coast from which C-5s operate. And on the West Coast, I believe it's Travis Air Force Base north of San Francisco, which I've also visited. And way down there you can see, uh, I don't know if my camera's focusing properly, there's a bunch of C-5s over there. They also operated a lot of C-141s out of Scott Air Force Base at the times I was there especially the first time. <clears throat> so we saw these things operating quite regularly. That's kind of an interesting thing there. I had never seen that before. Part of the aircraft landing gear strut pops through this hatch on the top. I never got in the position of one of these to see that happening. But indeed, the... Uh, C-141A over there has the same thing going on, so that's a new one on me. I didn't know they did that. The uh, rear end of the C-141 opens up in a clamshell fashion. But of course this one's closed, but it's got a a pallet sitting there as if it's ready to be uh, launched out the rear. Of course the 141 being primarily a cargo plane and skids could be brought on here and there's all sorts of tie downs and latch downs and a, a rail that can be exposed here to roll things on. But of course it did have fold-up webbing chairs along the walls to carry troops. And they could use it to parachute out of, I believe, but certainly to transport troops. Rather spartan on the inside. Very dark up here in the front. But there's an opportunity to look inside the flight deck.
returning from the front of the C-141 towards the rear and there's also a set of airline type chairs which could be fitted um, to this aircraft if it was going to be used to carry additional troops more than you could fit just along the side. I'm not sure what they did for toilets in that case. They probably would bring some sort of a module on board, I would guess. That would be like a portable airline toilet. That would be my guess. And this also shows how you could carry litter patients on these if you were using it for medical uh, airlift. Great airplane. I was talking before about the version of the <clears throat> the DC-9 that was used by the Air Force as a medical airlift plane with the Red Cross on the tail. That was what they would call the C-9 or the C-9A and its nickname was the Nightingale after Florence Nightingale. And um, here's an example right here. So the uh, C9A, or here is it says A slash C, Nightingale, operated from the mid 60s um, and uh, could carry 30 to 40 stretcher patients or 40 ambulatory patients or a combination of the two. And it even points out here that a typical mission, a C9, would be dispatched from Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. Uh, to Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany or Yokota Air Force Base in Japan to fly civilian or military airstrips, pick up patients, fly them to hospitals a uh, thousand miles away. There were 20 C-9s used for medic vac aircraft, but another three C-9Cs used as VIP transports. The last of them were retired in 2005. Have a, a Lockheed C-130 transport known as the Hercules. Also a very famous aircraft. A good medium cargo aircraft. Troop carrier used for parachutes, uh, parachutists, and myriad other uses. A gunship. Designed in 1951 for the U.S. Air Force Tactical Air Force or Tactical Air Command, it set a new pattern for military transport aircraft. Previous types usually had piston engines, tailwheel landing gear, and side doors. The Hercules used turboprops for improved performance, a high wing to avoid encroaching on the cargo space, and to provide excellent short takeoff and landing capability, and a sturdy tricycle landing gear to enable it to operate from unpaved airstrips. This is a C-130E, which is an extended range development of the C-130B, and it has two underwing fuel tanks, which you can see there, which increase the range, and it provided rapid tactical airlift and airdrop of cargo and troops. It saw extensive use in Vietnam and all over the world, really. Now here they have an A-26C Invader built by Douglas 
And that's one cool thing I like about this museum I haven't seen elsewhere. A lot of times you have to walk really close to the planes to see what kind of plane they are, if you don't already know, in order to read the signs. But here they have a like a park bench in front of each airplane with the name of the plane um, looks like you know laser or high pressure water cut in the back and you can see that from a lot further away that's a nice touch kudos to whoever thought that up anyway this A26C is known as the invader these were supposed to be built in large numbers to replace the three medium bombers that the Air Force had the A20 Havoc the B-25 Mitchell and the B-26 Marauder. So the A-26 Invader served briefly in Europe and Pacific in the closing months of World War II. But they were used here at Dover to develop um, various rocket systems to be launched from aircraft, which was again part of the purpose of this, this hangar and these buildings was the development of rockets. So that's why this plane is here, even though it's not a cargo or refueling aircraft, it's here because of its use in the capacity of rocket development. Since my original audio got blotted out by the wind, I'm just going to restate here. This is apparently the uh, fuselage and all the other parts of a Fairchild C-119 flying box car. The fuselage section is turned up on side uh, on a pallet. They were originally going to bring this to the museum on a C-5, but plans were changed, so they ended up trucking it to the location here. Uh, there you can see the wings uh, stacked up on a pallet for transport. Um, and uh, let's see, an engine nacelles in the background there. And then behind the wings, whoop, there's the uh, on its side fuselage section again. And there in the back in silver color, are the uh, tail booms that had a twin tail boom design and then there are some other crates and things there that contain other parts of the aircraft but they're uh, planning to restore that. This is another one of the Fairchild aircraft. This is a C-123K provider. I know they had the packet and they had the flying box car they got the provider. One of many innovative aircraft designs to come on the scene just after World War II, the C-123 provider began life as a cargo glider and then they added engines to it and made it a powered aircraft. All metal glider designed with conversion to powered assault transport in mind. First flew in 1951. They built 302 of these aircraft entering service in 1955. That looks like a de Havilland, uh, was that the Caribou, I think? Come back around to that. So that's a provider. Is that the flying box car then? This one. I get confused between the Fairchild and the Fairchild models. I have a hard time remembering which one's which. Let's get this around so we can get a better view of it. There's a nice C-124 that we'll come back to later. Yeah, this is the flying box car here. The C-119G. boom cargo planes that were Fairchild's trademark in the post-1945 era. This is one of them and the heavy lift transports helped the United States to reach out with its newfound post-war power. C-119s formed the backbone of the United States Air Force transport in the 50s, used heavily in the Korean War, 
and uh, used in Vietnam as well when a number of them were brought out of retirement or mothballs and used as close support gunships and interdiction roles and I'm sure just as cargo transports as well. I've always really loved these Fairchild planes. I gather they were not very glamorous to crew on but I often thought if I was in the Air Force this is the kind of plane I'd think I might like to be on actually. The planes are very basic. I think designed to be very serviceable and tolerant of abuse and you know easily repairable just take anything and keep on going type of aircraft simple and practical get the job done I would imagine there'd be lots of interesting flying associated with them not very exciting maybe a lot of the time but Over here we have a constellation type. Once again, I've got a rotator. The sun's not in my eyes. It has been very rainy since I've been out on the east coast here the last week of December 2018. And I'm just fortunate that it worked out where it's a nice sunny day. Temperatures in the 50s. So this is a C-121C. Super Constellation. And uh, the Connie here uh, started out in 1943 as a C-69 Constellation prototype. A small number were built and then the Super Constellations, uh, of which this is an example, uh, was really just the, a military version of the commercial Lockheed Constellation and it served between 1948 and 1955. The Air Force had 150 of these used as a combination cargo and passenger carrier, executive transport, and airborne early warning aircraft. Always a very beautiful airplane. but it's not open now. When I first spotted this guy over here I thought it was a B-29 but on closer inspection I can tell it's a B-50. <coughs> which is the later variant of the B-29. Upgraded, modernized in many ways, improved systems, improved reliability, had different engines on it powerful, faster, more reliable than those used on the B-29. Other enhancements such as a steerable nose wheel. And I always thought the easiest way to recognize these besides that at least some of them had auxiliary jets and they had these uh, extra fuel pods on them was that the engines had um, a very different nacelle and they had the air scoops down at the bottom that's actually the first thing I usually look for from a distance to differentiate a B-29 from a B-50. They must have had some issues with this guy leaking because they've got a tarp over the cockpit. <coughs> so this is another variant of the B-29 or B-50. Um, it's a uh, cargo and refueling version. And uh, the same or a similar auxiliary jet uh, engines hanging off the wings. It has the double bubble fuselage. And there was a commercial version of this aircraft uh, made by Boeing. They used them a lot for passenger transport. I know they used them a lot between um, continental U.S. and Hawaii, for example, other Pacific destinations. This is the C-97L Strato Freighter. 
this is, as they say here, it's the, the cargo version of the World War II B-29 bomber, but as I pointed out, it, it really has all the other things like the steerable nose gear, the improved systems, the improved engines, the extra jets, so it's really more like a B-50 than a B-29. Um, this aircraft, its type first flew in 44, became most valuable to the Air Force when the tanker version was introduced in 1950, which is the KC designation. That's uh, what's tacked on the front of Air Force uh, refueling aircraft or tankers. And this is the last model they made, the KC-97L, with the two jet engines added to increase speed so they could be used to refuel the newer jet bombers and fighters. <clears throat> These were serving in the National Guard until 1977. This uh, exact example here was obtained from the uh, Beale Air Force Base, California. Do they have this one open? Doesn't look like it. C5A. In its early military airlift command livery, not the nearly black or dark gray <clears throat> or olive drab liveries it's had at other times. It is pretty windy out here today, so I'm trying to face. <clears throat> the microphone away from the wind. I'm hoping it's not going to get wiped out by the wind too much. Offhand, I can't think of another museum at this time where you can go to see a C-5 of any sort. My understanding is that the <clears throat> Air Force Museum in Dayton has one there, uh, but I don't know that it's on display yet. So, uh, C-5A, the most noticeable and revolutionary design feature of the C-5 Galaxy was its immense size. It was the biggest and heaviest airplane in its class when test pilots thundered aloft for the first time in June of 1968. Today they're up to the, the M model, having graduated all the way up from A to M, and it's called the Super Galaxy now, and it continues to be the largest aircraft in the U.S. Air Force inventory. this is a large and complex aircraft. Just looking under the up in the nose gear area, it looks really simple. These big jack screws here are part of the kneeling system that the C5 has that allows it to raise or lower quite a lot to accommodate uh, loading of different cargo and uh, otherwise it looks pretty straightforward but you've got these huge long jack screws and then these hydraulic cylinders here are for the nose wheel steering you need a lot of power to swing that four wide nose gear around and the uh, gear doors uh, come in from the side they kind of slide in as opposed to swinging in and let's see what else is up here. Um, there's the locking mechanism to hold the gear in the up position during flight. Pretty cool. I don't think I've been to any place with a C5 where they let people come this close to them before except to walk through. The 
this has the original engines on it, of course, being an A model. And these things were monster shriekers. People who are familiar with the C5 just love these engines, the sound of them, even though it's really annoying to be inside the plane from what I've heard. and my voice doesn't get blotted out by all the wind out here. So we get nice views of the landing gear here. And uh, here's the big jack screws used for kneeling to the per landing gear truck assembly. one with two wheels at its ends. So six wheels per truck assembly. With a total of uh, four of these. And again a relatively simple landing gear bay for these guys but it's very shallow and uh, a lot of people have commented it that I've heard about, you know, how did they fit those landing gear in here, uh, and the way they did it was um, the first thing that would happen is the landing gear would rotate 90 degrees this way, so the wheels were pointing in this direction instead of this direction, and then they would kind of, the whole landing gear would swing up and then swing in, so the wheels actually ended up laying in here like this instead of this. And then of course the gear doors, which are these right here, would kind of roll up and cover it. And then these outer gear doors would come down and cover the outer part of it. Rather ingenious design. It does make for some of the more complex landing gear. Languages here, which are no doubt associated with that. And another thing about the C5 landing gear, which I'm not sure too many other aircraft share, is that I think just due to its large weight and other factors, they can end up with fairly high tire pressures from time to time, and they don't want to park the uh, landing gear inside the aircraft during takeoff until the tires have had a chance to cool down and there are sensors on it. And each of the four main landing gear retracts independently, and if one of them isn't cool enough, it may partially retract, but the doors don't close, it doesn't completely fit inside the airplane. I think there's always a danger of uh, tire explosion under those conditions, and they want that to happen when it's still kind of outside the airplane. Well, this is certainly the first time I've had the opportunity to stick my head inside a C-5 landing gear bay. Very nice. And they do have it open. I wonder if they're going to let us go upstairs into the cockpit and the crew area. That'd be nice. I have walked through a couple C5s before just on the cargo. Here's the uh, rear door of the C5, and this is the folded up ramp that goes out the back, and then of course there are clamshell doors behind that. Here's the folded up ladder. Um, there's sort of a hump 
uh, up above this area that goes all the way back to the tail. And in there is a single level uh, area with uh, accommodations for quite a few troops. I don't know, 40 or 50 or something like that, I'm guessing. And this ladder here folds down and would come down diagonally and come almost to the wall here. So you'd come up close to the wall and then you'd go up these stairs to get up into that upper level. And up there is outfitted very much like a commercial airliner with airliner type seats. And, uh, you know, it's not as spartan up there as the cargo area is. And they'd have, you know, modern airline toilets and things like that and availability of food. And they could transport the soldiers that might be a comet, uh, accompanying the cargo that's being transported or vehicles or aircraft because you could carry tanks, trucks, buses, um, helicopters, other airplanes inside the cargo hold here. systems down and uh, you know once the airplane sits for a while the systems just get more unreliable. Well it uh, stood the test of time. This was in service. 43 years. 42. Oh, 42. Now, uh, they give these things a furrow. Well you know and they're still flying B-52s. Absolutely. And they're, they could potentially some of those H models could potentially be 100 years old before they're back. But what, as long as you keep, but like, almost all 52s have been reskinned, re-winged. So you're keeping the basic skeleton there, but you're pretty kind of putting new skin on them, outfit, all new avionics, electronics. But you take care of my airplane. So I had a nice uh, visit inside the C-5 here talking with a couple of retired crew chiefs. Uh, but they, they're not going to let anybody go upstairs. Safety issues. Uh, one thing I learned about the C-5, which I did not know, and apparently C-130s and C-17s have the same thing now, is they have, uh, what do you call it, LACOM or something like that? I probably got it wrong. But it's a uh, laser protection system for large aircraft. And they have uh, those things located somewhere on here. I'm not sure where. So if their uh, systems detect that there's missiles tracking them, for example, somebody's launched a, a missile from another aircraft or from the ground at them, they can take out the, um, the tracking systems on the trailing missiles using this laser system so they don't have guns or anything but they have that to restate what i was trying to say that got blotted out by the wind here the uh, docents in the c5 said that the c5 and several other large air uh, aircraft operated by the air force have laircom which is a uh, laser defense system that would defeat the tracking systems on missiles that are targeted at the aircraft my understanding was that that was a system that had been proposed but not implemented yet, so I'm not sure these guys were correct. Um, they also said that the aircraft had flare launchers, which I, I imagine is true. Uh, the other thing they were talking about is that this wing section down here is one of several that were cut out of a very old and well-used C-5 for study by the Lockheed Corporation, and that they determined based on the... Uh, in detailed study of these wing sections that the C-5 fleet should be structurally good for many decades yet.
Yeah, at Robbins Air Force Base, Georgia, as part of a test to check for signs of hidden corrosion by cutting apart a retired C-5A. That was nice. And uh, swinging over from the C-5 here um, is a KC-135 which is a uh, called the strato tanker and that's one of the ones that's still being operated by the Air Force along with the um, KC-10 I believe is the name of it. This one's based on the 707 by Boeing whereas the other one's based on the DC-10 airliner. Okay, what do we have here? This looks like a Lodestar, I think. It's a, uh, yeah, a Lockheed C-60 Lodestar. Used during World War II, uh, when the military bought or pressed into service all kinds of civilian transport aircraft, the Lockheed Lodestars were smaller and faster than the Douglas DC-3 that had become the industry standard. So they commandeered over 50 of the early model load stars under the designations of C-56, C-57, C-59, but the definitive version was the C-60, of which over 350 were actually built as that instead of um, uh, commandeered. Used for crew and paratroop training, moving freight, transporting VIP passengers. Uh, quite a fast aircraft, medium range transport, they served adequately, but most were retired from military service before the end of the war. Many were converted into executive transports after the war. And here we have a U-3A, the Blue Canoe. They just wanted an off-the-shelf twin-engine aircraft for light cargo and personnel transport duties. And they selected the Cessna Model 310, and they acquired 160 of them and designated it the L-27A. Uh, later on, they redesignated it to the U-3A. And this is a uh, C-45G Expediter, one of the many versions of the Beechcraft. <clears throat> uh, model 18. And uh, people who've seen my other videos, uh, the one video I have from Janesville, Confederate Air Force, or commemorative Air Force out there, I took a ride on a C-45, the Bucket of Bolts. Very similar to this model, the nose is a little different and some other things, but it's still a C-45. It's not a very big airplane, but a good airplane. Relatively simple and reliable. They told me when I arrived at the museum that due to the bad weather they'd been having, uh, they did not anticipate a large turnout of crowd today, and therefore they didn't call in many of their docents, therefore they didn't have many people to open up aircraft that are more often open, so only the C-141 and the C-5 are open.
So uh, I was starting to talk about this before I got detoured. And this is a KC-135E Strato tanker, again based on the Boeing 707. By the early 1950s, the Strategic Air Command, or SAC, needed a refueling aircraft that could air refuel the B-52 Strato Fortress bomber. The refueler they had at that time, the KC-97, which is this one we already looked at, had a hard time keeping up with the speed of the B-52, and they could only do it in a dive. So Boeing designated the jet-powered KC, or designed the KC-135, and they further refined their flying boom design um, and uh, let's see uh, the KC-135 fleet which they still have today they still operate these but uh, a lot of the refueling is being done by uh, the military version of the DC-10 airliner which is called the KC-10 extender and that's of course a much bigger airplane with a much greater refueling capability but they still do operate these. I've, I've seen them around. Okay, another voiceover to replace original dialogue blotted out by the wind. Uh, swinging by the C-133 and coming up on the tail of the C-124, Globemaster II. Uh, there actually were three aircraft uh, have been three aircraft so far named Globemaster. The original Globemaster was the uh, C-74 which was a cargo version of the Douglas DC-4 airliner and the uh, this C-124 also a Douglas aircraft and you know the wings and so on were were based on large uh, Douglas uh, commercial transports but the fuselage is much enlarged so this was known as the Globemaster II. And of course the modern C-17 uh, cargo aircraft is known as the Globemaster III. But uh, this is the C-124, Globemaster II. And it was uh, a popular aircraft for a while. Uh, very unwieldy, but it did good service. And uh, I'll give more detail on that once we get a little bit closer to it. The um, nickname of this aircraft is Old Shaky. Now I'll let my original dialogue pick up. And it's an expanded fuselage version of another Douglas aircraft. remember which one. Um, I'm not sure if it's a DC-7, a DC-8, something like that, or not. Yeah. Let's see. No, it couldn't be a DC-8 because that was a jet aircraft. Maybe it was a DC-7. I don't think it says here. The C-124 Globemaster II, nicknamed Old Shaky, entered service in May 1950. It carried more supplies and equipment faster and farther than any previous transport. It was a major redesign of the C-74 Globemaster that was developed at the end of World War II and had the same wings, tail, and engines. The C-124 was one of the first aircraft in which cargo loading and handling was considered from the start. It had a clamshell nose uh, for the loading doors in the front, a loading ramp, electric hoist, two overhead cranes, and the 77-foot long cargo hold. Could carry heavy tractors and so on and trucks. This is one of only nine C-124s still in existence of the 449 built and it's one of the oldest in existence or it says it's the oldest in existence and it's the only A model that still exists. This aircraft served in the Strategic Air Command or SAC Military Air Transport Service MATS Tactical Air Command TAC and the Air Force Reserve. Okay, let's go over and take a look at the C-133 Cargo Master. 
another Douglas product and one which uh, immediately followed the C-124 as the aircraft's uh, largest cargo aircraft. Uh, these things had a, a kind of a dicey history. They performed very well and served for quite a while, uh, but they had a, a lot of operational difficulties being rushed directly into service without a prototype stage. I saw these flying a bit when I was a young kid. My father had a chance to fly on them sometimes. So here we have the C-133B Globe uh, Cargo Master. It was designed to one around one major mission, hauling the first generation intercon intercontinental ballistic missiles. This was the largest of these was the Atlas missile. The aircraft's aft loading ramp, clamshell doors, and large circular fuselage made loading much easier than earlier generations of cargo planes. It's still the largest turboprop aircraft ever built for the U.S. Air Force. The Dover C-133 broke the world's heavy lift record by 40,000 pounds when it lifted 117,900 pounds to 10,000 feet in 1958. The uh, aircraft, in addition to missiles, it could carry 17 loaded jeeps or three fire trucks or other similar truck loads and tractors. They only built 50 of these. They operated out of Dover Air Force Base here in Travis in California, and they were retired in 1971. There is a uh, C-133 at the Travis Museum, which I visited a couple of times. I always thought this plane looked weird because it didn't seem like the engines were big enough. Because all the other big aircraft at that time had piston engines which were physically much larger for their power output. But some of the problems the C-133 had were structural. Um, the fuselage was not stiff enough. And, they and once again, uh, reiterating what I tried to say that got blotted out by the wind, the uh, fuselage was not stiff enough on the C-133, and you can see a lot of reinforcing bands uh, around this area. And this cargo door on the side, it had the rear clamshell cargo door, but the cargo door on the side had a tendency to not close properly uh, when the plane had been loaded. Then the fuselage would flex, and they would have to taxi the plane around uh you know, jouncing it around and flexing the fuselage while pulling on the door until finally the fuselage would flex just right so the door would close. Uh, and another problem was the uh, issues of the high speed uh, propellers on these uh, turboprop engines. It would fling supersonic vortices off the tips of the props that would impinge upon the side of the fuselage right along there. You can see where the black line is. Uh, in that area and it was like pelting the sides of the fuselage with stones at uh, at high speed and uh, so they had to build a lot of reinforcement and overlay plates and you know metal bands and all sorts of things and you could see here along the fuselage where it's kind of normal and all of a sudden you get these reinforcing bands that have been added the C-133 is not the only airplane to have reinforcing bands added here and there, but I think many of them were added as part of the design, where on the C-133 they were added as an afterthought once they found out they needed them. neglected the UH-1N over here, or, <coughs> excuse me, the UH-1N, which is a version of the Huey helicopter, uh, but the Air Force version. And they have that here. Of course, it's called the Iroquois officially, nicknamed the Huey. A straightforward single engine design with a crew of two plus uh, room for crew chief and door gunners. Uh, in combat, the Huey flew three distinct missions 
as troop transports, as gunships, or as medevac aircraft. Because this was used uh, in a cargo capacity by the Air Force, uh, that's its reason for being at this museum. to the uh, de Havilland Caribou here, which the U.S. Air Force designated as the C-7A. This is uh, made in Canada, and they consider it as the DHC Caribou. It's a dedicated short takeoff and landing utility transport, which fl first flew in 1958, designed to combine uh, short takeoff and landing performance of the other uh, uh, de Havilland cargo airplanes, such as the Otter, with the load carrying capability of a DC-3. The U.S. Army was so impressed by the rugged Caribou, it ordered 159 of them, and it became a standard transport aircraft. A number of them were redesignated in 1967 as um, C-7s for the Air Force, so they would have served in the Army first before being transferred to the Air Force. Here we have a F-101B Voodoo, which served from 1951 to 1973. Um, and that's because Dover Air Force Base had an additional mission of hosting fighters from the Air Defense Command's 98th Fighter Interceptor Squadron. So they operated those out of this uh, base for a while. It's not a cargo aircraft, but this is one of the exceptions uh, to the general rule that this is a transport and refueling aircraft museum only. And here's an interesting plane to have here. This is an Antonov AN-2. So it's a Russian aircraft built by the Antonov Design Bureau. And uh, it was created to meet the need for a rugged flying truck carrying loads into rough short strips in the interior of the USSR. Uh, it featured a somewhat antiquated biplane design that ensured the aircraft was stable easy to fly and could land in fields of less than 650 feet. It was successful as a troop carrier, cargo crop spraying, air ambulance, regional airliner. They also uh, produced them in China and Poland. So this was not really a U.S. Air Force plane, but it still has a place of honor here at the Air Mobility Command Museum. So here we have an F-106A Delta Dart, which was introduced in the late 1950s, built by Convair, one of the fastest fighters in the world at that time. It was stationed here at Dover, and that's why it's at this museum. Again, not because it's a cargo or refueling aircraft, but because of its history at Dover. Here we have a Douglas C-54M Skymaster. This was the military variation of the commercial DC-4 commercial transport. Flown by the Army Air Force in World War II and during the Korean War. 
primary role as a cargo transport, but it also flew air sea rescue, rescue, scientific military research, missile tracking, and recover operations. It, the uh, one of the C-54s was also the first presidential transport aircraft, known as the Sacred Cow, used by President Roosevelt. During the Berlin airlift from 1948 to 1949. C-54s such as this delivered coal, food, and other supplies to the people of blockaded West Berlin. That leaves one other airplane that's outside here that we have not visited yet. Looks like they have a tower tour going on right now. I wonder if I can get into it. This is a C-131D Samaritan. This is uh, based on the Convair 240, 340, or 440 airliners. These were primarily used uh, as passenger transports, but they also used them for cargo and training operations and all sorts of other things. So I was really surprised at the two and a half hours I spent at the museum that I didn't see a single C-5 operating and even the docents said they were surprised because usually the things seem to be buzzing around like flies but for one reason or another it was a, a quiet day for C-5 operations at Dover Air Force Base. Just my dumb luck I guess. If you're out on the East Coast, Chesapeake Bay Bridge again going westbound this time. Figured I would shoot video of it since I'm here. There's a nice bit of chop out on the bay. from the, the causeway type structure and now we're going to go out on the first uh, um, trestle bridge section which is a different design than the one we went through going the other direction. I don't know if this side is newer or what but it's got more of a sweeping curve to the structure. Less of a box shape than going the other way.
and then up ahead is the suspension bridge, which again is a uh, same overall design but different in its details. So I don't know the history of this bridge, but I suspect that this side is the newer of the two. at least they're different in their design going this direction. It's a nice tall bridge you really get up here in the air. immediately after coming off the western end of the suspension bridge section makes a pretty good curve I don't know what it is 30 degrees or so which is a bit unusual distinct impression that one cannot bicycle over this bridge. A lot of bridges will have a bicycle lane, but I don't see one either direction here, so I'm guessing you can't do it. And I haven't seen any indication of tolls being required to go this direction as there was toll required going the other way. Traffic's a bit backed up going the other direction. Yeah, I guess they just get you going eastbound. And I'm on Highway 301 southbound. I was bypassing the Washington DC area. This is the, uh, I don't know if it's Nice or Nice slash Middleton Bridge crossing the Potomac River. Looks to be a fairly old bridge, single lane each way. steady with these bouncy roads.
took a chance on taking U.S. Highway 301 back from Delaware to Virginia instead of I-95, thinking it would be a nice country highway. In fact, it was incredibly slow and congested four-lane highway, sometimes six lanes, but uh, it has a stoplight every half mile and just tons of traffic on it, so it just crawls. Big mistake. Luckily, I wasn't in a big hurry for anything. But it kind of comes down on a long peninsula, so by the time you realize what's going on, it's further to backtrack than to just stick with it. But now that I've crossed the, uh, the Potomac here, now I can jump over to I-95 if this highway proves to be slow. So, anybody else wants to travel in this direction, watch out for Highway 301.
first half of the American Express Chef Flight 4122 with Los Angeles Service to Chicago here at International Airport. My name is Anthony. I'll be your flight attendant today for your safety and your comfort on this one hour 55 minute flight over to Chicago. The flight is in very command with Captain George and First Officer Alberta. We invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight over to Chicago. Anything to make your flight more enjoyable and comfortable, please ask and take a call upon me. Sit back, relax. Relax and enjoy the flight over to Chicago.
Alabama, welcome to Chicago. The local time here is 2.32. We'll be taxiing for the next few minutes, so please remain seated with your seatbelt fastened and all of them stowed until the seatbelt sign is turned off. Please make sure you have all of your personal belongings and be careful when opening a ride compartments. You are not free to use your mobile phones and small lightweight devices in transit mode. If you are connecting to another flight, please check the United app on your mobile mobile device and see the airport displays for up-to-date flight status and gain information. If you check your carry-on baggage plane tag and receive the green tag, you may claim your carry-on baggage on the jet bridge. All other check baggage will arrive at your destination and baggage claim. Please step to the far right of the jet bridge while you are waiting to allow other customers to the plane. Thank you for your cooperation. On behalf of United Our Star Alliance partners and your flight crew, thank you for flying the friendly skies with us today. We hope you've had a pleasant experience and we look forward to serving you again on another United flight. Have a great afternoon. A happy new year. Once again, welcome to Chicago. We'll be arriving at gate C1, Terminal 1, Concourse C. Baggage claim will be at Carousel 3. Again, baggage claim will be at Carousel 3. All other bags with green tags will be at the jet bridge. All other bags with green tags will be at the jet bridge. All the other bags will be at Carousel 3. <laughs> 